From farming, let's switch to medicine, where robots are starting to become common in the developed world's operating theatres for certain procedures. Robots offer the promise of more accurate surgery in certain situations. However, until recently, robots have been blind and they still need a surgeon to use their vision to assess the situation and control the position of the robot and the patient appropriately. Our next speaker's presentation will describe the likely next technology that may give surgical robots new capabilities, robotic vision. Jonathan Roberts is Professor in Robotics here at QUT. His main research interest is in the area of field robotics and in particular autonomy, that is making machines work by themselves. Jonathan was a co-inventor of the UAV Challenge, an international flying robot competition that sees teams search for a lost bushwalker using autonomous robot aircraft. Before joining QUT, Jonathan was the research director of CSIRO's Autonomous Systems Laboratory, where in addition to leading a group of 100 researchers, he developed projects in the area of museum robotics and telepresence. Jonathan is a past president of the Australian Robotics and Automation Association and serves as an associate editor of the Journal of Field Robotics. Since joining QUT, Jonathan has teamed up with surgeon and QUT professor Ross Crawford to develop a new class of surgical robo ro robots. To hear more, please make Jonathan welcome. I'll use these in a little while. So where have I got to point this to make it work? Okay, so uh, first of all, Ross sends his apologies. He would love to be here, but he's actually one of these rare people that has a great life with multiple jobs. So he's actually in surgery right now, uh, performing real surgery, fixing people. So that's what he does on Mondays and Tuesdays. Wednesdays and Fridays he works at QT and Thursdays he sees people in a nice suit on his private days uh, talking to patients. So I've teamed up with Ross and we're, we're trying to tackle this problem so that maybe one of these events in 20 years time Ross can be here because our robots will be actually performing the surgery. So this is very new work um, and we've only started exploring this work in the middle of last year. Now QT has um, a lot of capability in robotics and it also has a lot of capability in uh, medical research. So this is all about getting, getting this together. We also have an interest in generally driving down the cost of medical robotics. Uh, I'll explain that a little bit later. Um, I'm going to skip this slide and talk here about this working together. So um, this, this sort of new class of robots you can, only, you can really only develop these systems when you get the engineers together with the surgeons, uh, with other types of, uh, all the different types of engineers, uh, the life scientists. This sort of uh, technology won't really be developed unless all of these people get together. And it's probably held people back to this point, uh, which is why things probably haven't developed as fast as they could. Brief history of medical robotics. Um, this is a, a, scary, a scary thing that happened in 1985. This was an industrial robot on the left here, which was known as a, a Puma robot. These robots are actually relatively dangerous in that uh, they're not very compliant. If they hit you, you will know about it. Um, but they were actually used in surgery in 1985 uh, in a procedure where they were putting um, radioactivity into people's brains to kill cancer. Um, and the reason to do, uh, use a robot to do this is the precision. So um, robots are very precise. And surgeons getting to the right spot in your brain just to burn that little bit of cancer out, that's, that's a difficult thing for a surgeon to do. A human, I should say a human surgeon. We'll start to talk about surgeons as being robots soon. But that's hard for a, a human to do. So in 1985, the first experiments were done, and they were relatively successful. Um, this is what medical robotics looks like now. Um, you can see here the surgeon is the person on the left sitting on that stool. Um, there are a whole lot of assistants there on the right and the patient is under, under the drapes there. And those sort of black things in the right hand side, on the right hand side there are robot arms and manipulators. Um, this device is now um, seen in many hospitals uh, in the, in the uh, developed world. It's known as the Da Vinci system. 
and it's used for a, a widespread um, different sorts of uh, surgery, mainly around the abdomen, uh, where you can sort of uh, cut little holes in there, inflate, uh, get a bit of space, make a little cave, and then the robot arms go in there and start to do the work. But of course, the critical thing is the surgeon's the person doing the control. So the surgeon's there, you can see their head is shoved right into this device. They're actually looking through a camera. So there's also a camera placed inside on one of those arms. They effectively appear like they're inside the patient. Uh, they have little joysticks uh, and they move, uh, they move uh, the manipulators around. So currently these robots work in these three kind of broad categories. Um, the one I just talked about um, is a tele-robot. So this is where the, you can think of these robots as very advanced remote control systems. So the, 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 the human surgeon is still actually doing the control, but they're not touching the tools. They're, they're, they're sitting to the side. And the beauty of this is you can scale the force and the, and the movement. So a surgeon with their big clunky hands can only do so much. If you have the, the robotic arms could be much smaller and you can sort of change the amount of motion a surgeon has and scale it down and do small things. Um, so that's one great advantage. And that's where the Da Vinci robot has been used uh, up until now. Then there are these pre-programmed robots. Um, these are, are robots that are sometimes pre-programmed in surgery. There's some medical image, imaging happening um, and the robot goes and performs a little segment and the surgeon is completely off the tools. Uh, an example of that is prostate cancer resection. So they, uh, there are, there's a procedure at the moment where uh, the gentleman here might squirm a bit, but where a robot inserts its tool uh, in your urethra um, and uh, it actually mills out the prostate that way. Um, when these techniques were first developed, people were um, very nervous about a machine doing that. Um, um, they would rather a human do it until people pointed out that these machines were actually far more accurate and they didn't have wobbly hands. Um, and, then, and the whole thing's reversed around now. Now most people will want the robot to do that procedure and they really don't want the human, uh, human anywhere near them. Um, so you can see how sort of the world changes. Then there's a, a sort of a, a class of uh, robotics which we're now seeing, which is a sort of a shared class where the, the human surgeon is holding the tools, but the tools will refuse to do the wrong thing. Um, and there's a class of uh, procedures where you're milling bone or you're resecting other material. Um, and with uh, robotic tracking techniques, the, the tool is, becomes very smart and it simply won't do the wrong thing. So the surgeon's still in control, but if they're accidentally wanting to do the wrong thing, it won't be allowed to happen. So we're seeing all of these, all of these uh, things are happening now. Now one important thing to understand is um, operating on people is not like car assembly. Now you see this picture here on the right where you can see uh, that these industrial robots operating on a car. Industrial robots that build cars like this don't have actually many sensors uh, looking at the car. They're very self-aware and they know their own joints and they're very accurate and that's in fact why they're very accurate because they sense themselves very well. But they're not sensing the car. If that car wasn't there on the line they would still probably go and try and weld it. Um, the key thing that a surgeon does is they do this uh, hand-eye coordination thing, something Michael was alluded to earlier when he picked up the glass and showed you the difficulties there. That is really the key uh, skill of uh, a surgeon. Um, so vision is actually a, a, crucial, a crucial thing. Um, something we haven't really talked about here this morning, which is that uh, QUT is now the lead organisation in something called the Australian Research Centre for Robotic Vision. Um, and this is a new seven-year uh, research centre uh, funded by the ARC. And vision is obviously at the heart of this centre. And there's a whole lot of applications that have been identified as where vision is crucial. It appears that medical robotics is one of those application areas where vision will allow it to sort of just kick to the next level. Um, because at the moment, as I say, the surgeons, we still need their eyes. Um, here's just one example, and this is what uh, Ross is, I believe, doing this morning. So there's somebody asleep currently on a table with a, uh, uh, one of these devices in their knee. So hands up here who's got a knee. Right. That's more hands than who earns over $185,000. Uh, so this is, uh, this is where a camera goes currently into your knee. So if you have, 
uh, knee arthroscopy procedure done. Uh, this camera, this is a, just a, this is a, a, a tube. Um, there's a camera goes on here. This is inserted in your knee. The surgeon can look around inside your knee joint, which is not very big. It's about four or five millimeters uh, of space. They then insert on the other side a tool, and they can then do uh, repairs and remove things or stitch things. Um, this is actually a very difficult task, and it's it's really is all about hand coordination. These surgeons are you know they're they're amazing in what they do. They're they're holding these uh, two devices. They're actually also holding holding the patient's leg. They move the leg around to manipulate it so they can get the tools and the camera in the right locations. They have a foot pedal where they're controlling the cutting tool uh, and they're looking at a screen and seeing all this going on. And it's, it's as if they're kind of drumming and you know, they're chatting to all these people. And it's an, it's an amazingly difficult procedure uh, and it takes many years, uh, many years to learn. Um, now this is something that um, is hard for humans to do. And it's something that um, even though we think surgeons won't be fully automated, um, the part that's hard for them is actually this manipulation. And this is something that robots can probably do. Um, if the robots start to be able to manipulate the tools, um, the surgeons can focus on instructing the robots on what to do. Uh, and the procedure should be able to change. This is, this is the, the idea. Um, there's a lot of uh, manipulation and hand-eye coordination here. So the surgeon is looking at what they're doing. I didn't give you a gory, too gory a picture here. This is just a, uh, somebody having a look in, in a surgery. Um, there's hand-eye hand coordination in the tools. Uh, there's also hand-eye coordination in, in moving the leg. Um, so it's, uh, it's, a, it's a difficult thing for the person to do. The other, the other interesting point is when a surgeon is in your knee, here we go, I just brought one along. Uh, see if I can let's see if I can show you. Uh, when they're moving along here, um, of course they're repairing things. But at the same time, because it's so difficult, and this isn't because surgeons are bad, it's just because it's so difficult, occasionally um, this camera or the tool will run into the perfectly good part of the cartilage and there'll be unintentional damage will occur. That person will then get arthritis at a much faster rate than they would do otherwise. Um, and uh, you know that's generally a negative thing. So whenever, whenever surgeons are at their absolute limit, um, there's uh, an increased chance for bad things to happen. Um, so giving surgeons these tools should uh, reduce, uh, reduce these error rates. That's certainly the idea. Um, there are non-technical challenges here and um, acceptance issues. Um, this is where I go back to, though, the example of the um, prostate cancer resection. Um, when that procedure was first brought in, it wasn't widely accepted. Now everybody wants it done that way. So once people start to understand uh, the benefits, um, you know, the, things change. People's attitudes change. And finally, just my last slide, I, I looked at your paper in detail last night to see where surgeons were. And this is, this is kind of the, in, this is the, the other way around of the table. So these are the least likely people uh, to, be, uh, to be automated. And surgeons are actually there. So you know, it is still considered very unlikely that surgeons will be automated. And I still think it was very unlikely. I think surgeons will just have a, a better life. They will have a robot assistant. They will be instructing that robot assistant. Uh, hopefully they can speed up the number of procedures that they can do. Um, and everyone will benefit. So this should maybe not influence the number of jobs. Uh, it will just change the nature of their work. Okay, thank you. <clears throat>